Uh, thank you everyone for attending the press conference uh, on a Sunday night. See a couple of new faces today. Uh, I, we wanted to meet everyone because we are reporting higher cases today. Um, 38 locally transmitted, out of which 18 are now currently unlinked, but of course our contact tracers is uh, working very hard to try to link them. Um, so one reason for today's higher cases, partly is I think there are more transmission, but the other reason is that we are now using a new method, coupling ART, meaning uh, antigen rapid test, together with PCR. So how it works is that we have distributed ART kits to 236 of our clinics out of 900 of the PHPC's clinic. So for anyone that come forward to the clinics reporting uh, uh, ARI, um, uh, that means acute respiratory infection syndromes, the doctor will administer ART first. Yeah, and for those of you who have gone through ART before, it's a simple swap, 20 minutes you can get uh, an indication. So if they are positive, we can quickly isolate them and then administer a PCR test which we are also doing it faster. So as a result, today we have several uh, cases detected, seven, seven in all, all unlinked, detected because of this new method. And in the coming days, uh, we are going to distribute these ART kits to all the clinics, all our PHPC clinics. So I think that way we will be much more, we will be much faster in detecting cases that are in the community. The other thing we wanted to talk about today, which is uh, why Min Chan is here today, out of our 13, uh, or the, sorry, 18 unlinked cases, we have four students, but these four students has, have already been reported by MOE yesterday. So it's, it's not totally new cases, MOE reported them yesterday. They are all linked yeah, to the Learning Point cluster and quarantine before they are detected. Um, but we understand that as students are infected outside of schools, uh, parents are worried. So I'm sure both Min Chan and I, Min Chan as well as I, we are both getting numerous requests, uh, queries, that since we are approaching mid-year holidays, whether we should just advance the holiday or move to home-based learning. So that's why I think we discussed this and uh, Minister Chan will now take over to explain what MOE will do. Uh, thank you, Yikang. So, following from what Yikang has just mentioned, I think there are a few things that have developed in recent weeks that cause us to be much more concerned than before. Now, first, of course, we know that there are many new strains of the COVID-19 virus. There are various uh, new mutations. And some of these mutations are much more virulent and they seem to attack the younger children. So this is an area of concern for all of us. So the way we manage the situation must constantly keep abreast of such developments and preempt some of these developments where possible. So as Ikang mentioned, the sharp rise in the number of community cases today requires us to significantly reduce our movements and interactions in the coming days. Now, we are watching this very closely because we do not think that is a random thing that happened in just one day or so. So we want to make sure that while we are handling this situation, we have to significantly reduce our movement and interactions in the coming days. And to this end, MOE will move towards home-based learning for primary school, secondary school, JCs and Millennium Institute students, including students from the special ed schools, starting from Wednesday, 19th of May, 2021, until the end of the school term on Friday, 28th of May, 2021. And thereafter, the school children will be on the school uh, June holidays. Now, we understand, of course, this shift 
may cause anxiety in some parents. But we want to assure all parents and students that MOE will continue to extend our help and our fullest support to the schools, the teachers and the parents who require additional help to make these adjustments. And we will also want to put in place measures to continue to minimise the disruptions to the learning of our students. Now, preschools, including the MOE kindergartens and the student care centres, both in the schools and in the community, will remain open to support families who need their services during this period. As telecommuting is the default mode of working for most now, we will encourage parents to keep their children at home during this period where possible. But of course, we understand there are many parents who are essential workers who will need to continue to work at their places of work and therefore they will require services in the schools and in the childcare centres to help them during this period. And we will make all effort to help our parents and families who require such services. Now we make this move with the full knowledge that our schools can draw on their experiences in executing the home-based learning, the full home-based learning last year. And we are prepared to transit to online teaching and learning. Our teachers are also ready to help our students access a full range of online and hard copy home-based learning materials and assist students who may require digital devices or internet access and maintain regular contact with our students and their parents. Now, similarly, we will also look to convert more classes in the Institute of Higher Learning online to reduce in-person attendance. Now, this, remember, our thinking is to make sure that in the coming days, we significantly reduce the number of movement and interactions in order to minimise the chances of transmission of these new strains of the COVID-19 virus. <clears throat> For institutes of higher learning, labs and practical lessons will continue to be conducted in person with the necessary safe management measures in place. Tuition and enrichment classes should move their activities online till the end of phase two as well to prevent any intermingling and to cut down any possible transmissions. Now, having said that, <clears throat> I'd like to take a step back and look at how we manage the situation going forward. Now, going forward, we must work on the assumption that now and then there will be cases that will emerge in our community and perhaps in our school. Although thus far we have no conclusive evidence of school-based transmission, we must never be complacent. So going forward, we will need a range of options in order to thrive in the COVID world, for us to continue learning and living in the COVID world. So we must remain ajar and adapt accordingly. But we must have within our arsenal a suite of options especially to allow our students to continue learning in schools. Now, we all know that home-based learning over a prolonged period will have certain limitations. And to the extent possible, we will want to continue physical schooling for our children where possible. So, going forward, if the community situation does not warrant it, and if we only have sporadic cases in the schools, we will be able to use more targeted measures to ring fence schools that are affected while allowing the other schools to continue to operate. Now, going forward, we will also have a suite of other measures in place to allow our schools to have the best chance to provide physical schooling for our children. This includes vaccination of more younger cohorts when the approvals are given for the use of the vaccine. It will also include new and more 
rapid testing methods so that we can quickly ring fence the affected schools without having to close down all the schools for physical schooling or to convert all of them to home-based learning. And I want to emphasize that we are taking this measure now as a proactive step in order to make sure that our children are safe, our parents and our educators have peace of mind. And the significant increase in the community numbers today is a basis for us to want to move, to take this move now. And it's not just based on a few cases that we have detected in the school brought in from either their homes or the outside of school enrichment classes. So, having said that, MOE will continue to monitor the situation carefully and we will review our plans as necessary. But our fundamental aim is to make sure that we keep our students safe, keep our educators safe, and to allow our parents to have the peace of mind and the confidence when they send their children to the school for physical schooling. And we will have various combinations of different methods to make sure that our children will be, continue to be able to learn in a safe environment. Thank, thank you, Chun Seng. Um, maybe before we move to Q&A, maybe just let me say something about vaccinations. Um, as you know, vaccination does three things for us. Number one, uh, it provides a shield against infection of the COVID-19 virus. Number two, even if the virus broke through the, the uh, vaccination and you're infected, we hope it brings down the severity of the disease. And thirdly, being vaccinated, you reduce the likelihood of the person vaccinated to transmit to another person and slow everything down. And all three appears to be what is happening now in, in countries like Israel that has uh, vaccinated a big proportion of their population. So when we went into uh, the national vaccination exercise, the first phase um, was has been focused on those who need it most, meaning vulnerable uh, population that amongst us, and second, those in the front line, such as hospitals, seaport, airport, and teachers as well, teaching in the front line. And so for this group, we want to give them the maximum protection, meaning two doses. Yeah. And today, the progress has been good. So one quarter of our population today are fully vaccinated, two doses. Um, one third has at least one dose. Yeah. So I think we are now approaching phase two of the vaccination exercise. And MOH has been studying what phase two should look like. And one possibility to think about this is that maybe for phase two, we should try our best to give as many people as possible a good level of protection against COVID-19. That means give as many people as possible one dose of uh, COVID-19 vaccination without reducing the effectiveness. And there has been many international studies and it shows that even with one dose, it confers good protection um, without compromising efficacy. Yeah, one dose without compromising efficacy. So our scientists have been studying this. We have an expert committee, as you know, uh, and the evidence locally and overseas point towards this, uh, that and immunologists around the world uh, also express this opinion, that it is reasonable for those two actually to be further apart from those one. So instead of 21 or 28 days or three days, or, uh, three weeks or four weeks, which is the case currently, it can possibly extend to six to eight weeks uh, without materially impacting the efficacy of the vaccine. So this will also be helpful given our current situation where we have more cases and this is something we are studying uh, and when we are, once we are ready, not too long in the future, we will announce the details, how we are going about doing this. But rest assured, if we do this, and when we do this, all those 
who already have your second dose appointment will not be affected. This is a strategy for phase two of our vaccination exercise moving forward. Yeah. So I thought let everybody know this first while we continue our study, finalize the details, and once we are ready, we will put it out uh, very soon. Thank you. We can go to Q&A. Thank you, Ministers. We will now begin with the Q&A segment. Media agencies, please remember to use the resend function on Zoom if you'd like to ask a question. Do also remember to unmute before asking question. Kindly note that we will only take one question per media so as to allow more to participate. May we have the first question from SD. Ray, please. Hi, good evening, Ministers. Thank you for the briefing. Uh, just a quick question. Can we ask why is home-based learning only starting from Wednesday? And uh, can you elaborate on what you said earlier about how the more virulent strains are affecting uh, younger children? Thank you. Uh, to your first question, why home-based learning is only starting on Wednesday? There are a couple of reasons for this. Now, you remember yesterday, for those schools with confirmed cases, we have already swung into action and they will start their home-based learning from Monday. For the rest of the schools, <clears throat> they will typically take about one to two days to get their materials ready for them to brief the students and also the parents. At the same time, we are also cognizant from the feedback of the many parents who have contacted us that they will also need to make some adjustments to their plans. For example, uh, putting in place alternative uh, childcare arrangements for their children. So we are doing this uh, as soon as possible, which is why we're starting on uh, Wednesday. So this is the reasons why we are starting for all the schools, less the few schools that we have already highlighted yesterday for, with home-based learning from Wednesday onwards. Now, your second question as to the areas concerns, I think those... Uh, of you who have been <coughs> keeping abreast of the scientific literature, you will know that these new strains or these new strains of the COVID-19 virus seems to have a slightly different characteristics from the previous strains. And until today, I think many of the scientific communities are also trying to ascertain the different characteristics of these various new strains. But one of the things that we have seen seems to be at least from our numbers, there are more children who seem to have contracted <coughs> this virus. So, of course, that is an area of great concern to the Ministry of Education, the educators, and certainly our parents, which is why we are taking the necessary precautions in order to give ourselves the assurance that we are putting in place the best possible plans for our children so that they, have, they are safe and our parents are confident of the measures being put in place to ensure the safety of their children. Uh, DMS is not with us today, so the highly scientific question, I think we are a bit handicapped. But I did speak with him before coming to this press conference. Uh, he did mention that it would appear the V1617 strain appears to affect children more. So you'll notice that for schools, the response has been different compared to, say, last year. Uh, so once we detect uh, infection, but outside of school, um, MOE has been very fast actually to uh, put the school on home-based learning for the next few days and test the entire school. So uh, that was also a precaution that has been put in recently in view of uh, different behavior of this strain of virus. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Cha Pao? Tsupeng, please. Hi, good evening, Ministers. This is Zhi Feng from Zhao Bao. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that currently there's no evidence of school-based transmissions. However, could the transmission have taken place on the school bus since some of these schools with infected students, they actually share the same school bus vendor? And also, um, why not consider bringing forward the school holidays like we did last year? And um, this scientific question, mm -hmm. right, for these emerging strains, right, is the transmissibility and infectivity particularly high this time round, which could have possibly caused this exponential increase in cases? Because it seems like last year, one case can spread to two to three people, whereas for this year, one case can spread to up to four to six people. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let Thank me you. just uh, briefly touch on the latter part of the question. I think the behavior of the virus has not changed. Last year, too, 
one case need just one super spreading incident mm -hmm. or setting and you can spread to many cases. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this strain, I think, is no different, but it is true that there has been literature showing that it is more virulent, but fundamentally you are looking at a very contagious uh, virus. Huh? Yeah, on the questions about the transmission within school, now we are never complacent and we do not take the position that until we have evidence to do this before we start uh, acting on the evidence. Because if we do that, then we are looking at what we call the real view mirror rather than looking forward. Now having said that, what is of course of concern to us is not just what is happening within the classroom in the school setting. What is of course of concern to us will be the outside school activities and interactions, including what you have mentioned about the school bus. So we are looking into that, and that is also why we are asking all the outside school activities, like tuition centres, enrichment classes, to the extent possible, they should move to the online uh, learning during this period. Because we have tried our very best to make sure that we keep the cohorts within each of the school tight. And that is how we have been relatively successful in preventing transmissions within the schools. But as you have rightly pointed out, there are always the risk of transmission in outside school activities, meaning outside classroom activities. So we have to be very careful with this and never be complacent. And as the nature of the virus continues to evolve, we must never make the wrong assumption that the characteristics remain unchanged for the different strains of the virus. Now to your second question, uh, have we considered about bringing forward the school holidays? Yes, we have considered that. And we have taken into, taken into account the feedback from uh, various uh, sources, from the prof professional educators, from the parents, from the schools, leaders, uh, and so forth. And let me explain why we have not gone on to moving the school holidays forward, uh, which is about two weeks' time. Now, one of the reasons that we started this conversation was that, remember, we wanted to bring down the level of activity outside the home to as much as possible because of the sharp increase in the number of uh, community cases. And the feedback given to us from the parents, from the professional educators is that to the extent possible, they would also like their children to have some ways that they can continue to engage them meaningfully in the homes for the next two weeks. So the home-based learning allow us to achieve part of that objective. The second reason that uh, some of the professional educators and the schools have given us is that they are towards the tail end of the term already. <clears throat> they will just need a couple of days to wrap up this rather than to carry forward to the term three. Now, because bearing in mind, we are never sure what exactly will unfold in term three. And from last year's experience, we can see that if we load everything onto term three, then it can also be a very stressful period for the people, for the students, the parents and the schools in term three. So on balance, taking into account both the professional feedback and the feedback from the parents, we thought that it is meaningful for us to move to home-based learning for the remaining uh, eight schooling days. In fact, it's seven because of the public holidays uh, until the end of the term there. And the schools are well oiled in swinging into gear for this kind of operations because last year we have already put in place the necessary processes and measures for us to be able to switch to a home-based learning quickly. So these are some of the reasons why we have taken the decisions to have home-based learning for the remaining uh, seven learning days rather than to move the, holiday, move the entire holiday forward, which will then have another set of implications for the planning uh, for many of the families. Thank you, Ministers. Members of media, please only ask one question to allow more to participate. Can we get the next question from BBC? Karishma, please. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, thank you, ministers, for holding this press conference. You've indicated that students are being infected by the B161 strain of the virus. What's the status of the current kids who are infected? How much worse is the strain on the virus in terms of effects that you can see on the children? And in terms of timeline for vaccinations, why haven't you been faster? And do the vaccines we have show that they slow down the transmission even for the B1617 virus? Uh, let me take it. That's a series of questions. Sorry, um, yes, I apologize. Um, I think all these are valid, but I think there are also medical questions that we want to find out ourselves. As of now, I believe all the children are well. Yeah? Just like last year, some children, some students were infected and they tend to be well. So far, as far as I know, they are all well. Um, as to the other fairly valid technical questions you asked, these are questions we also want to find out. Uh, but we need some time. So if I may add to what uh, Ikang has shared, to our knowledge, all the students who are either under quarantine or who have been um, confirmed to have contracted the virus, uh, a few of them have mild symptoms, but no one is uh, very seriously ill at this point in time, and we are thankful for that. As to, as Ikang said, as to how um, this virus may affect the children differently from the other strains. Uh, I think that is best answered by the medical uh, fraternity, and we are certainly keeping a close watch on this. Uh, if I may just cover one other point, which I just uh, want to emphasize which just now during one of my answers. The schools will remain open to continue to provide support to those children and families with higher needs. So that, I think I've mentioned that, I just want to emphasize that because we are fully cognizant that some families and some children will need additional help during this period and we can be rest assured that the schools, the preschools, the student care centres will be available to help the children and the families with these uh, higher needs. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Reuters? Aradhana, please. Hi, um, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is again back on Krishna's question on our vaccination program. Just wondering, are we, why are we not able to accelerate our vaccination program? Is it because that there are tight supplies? And now, is that the reason why we're trying to uh, increase the interval between vaccine doses to stretch the supplies? So would it be possible to say how many vaccine doses we have in our inventory right now and how many are still on order? Okay. Um, the vaccine in our inventory goes up and down based on arrivals. Yeah? And we have a steady stream of arrival of supplies, uh, both Pfizer as well as Moderna, enough to cover our population. But they come at a certain pace. Yeah? So we are, our vaccination exercise is still pretty much uh, aligned. Uh, in tandem with the arrival of supplies. Okay, if we have a lot of supplies, of course, we'll do it faster, but we'll need to uh, administer doses um, based on the arrival of the supplies. But within that constraint, I was mentioning earlier, now that we have covered majority of uh, vulner vulnerable good groups, as well as those on the front line, for the next phase of our national vaccination exercise, we are studying possibility of giving as many people as possible one dose. So there's a change of concept, but without affecting those who already had their appointment. Yeah? Yeah. But to answer your question, it is limited. The pace is limited by the pace of the supply arriving in Singapore. Yeah. So if I may just add two points to that. Uh, that one part of the vaccination program that is new is when the approval for the vaccine for the vaccines to be used, to be authorized to be used for the younger age group. And we are talking about Pfizer, uh, which is now seeking approval for it to be used for the cohorts from 12 years old and above. Now, that is a new group of uh, people. And for this group of people, MOE is working closely with MOH to put in place our plans to vaccinate this group of people when the vaccines are available. And, we, and in the overall review, of the vaccination plan for the remaining of our population, we will take into account the prioritization for this group of people with the rest of the other age groups that may not have been vaccinated yet. 
But I also want to assure uh, fellow Singaporeans, actually, it's as, exactly as what Yi Kang said, our main constraining factor will be the supply of the vaccines. And if the supply of the vaccines are not disrupted, we'll be able to progressively do this at a steady pace. And if we look at our capacity for vaccination, we have built up our capacity for vaccination ahead of the vaccine's arrival. Today, we have about 40 vaccination centres all across the island. Every one of the vaccination centres can easily accommodate at least 2,000 uh, persons a day. So you see, our vaccination capacity is really much higher than our vaccines availability. And we have done this consciously because we know that the vaccines flow will be uneven across the time period. But at any one point in time, our vaccine capacity is all, our, vac our vaccination capacity is always higher than the availability of the vaccines. Then together with our queue management system, this gives us the confidence that once the vaccines arrive in Singapore, we can get it into the arm of our people in the shortest time possible because the people are ready to take the vaccine because they have signed up for it. We have built up the vaccination capacities in the 40 vaccination centres, the hospitals, the polyclinics and so forth. So this is how we are doing as fast as we can. But on top of this, it's exactly like what Ikang has mentioned, we are also looking at the strategy of vaccinating the remaining people based on the latest scientific evidence that we have in order to make sure that as many people get a certain level of protection as soon as possible. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from today? Jun Sen, please. Hi, Ministers. Uh, I have a question for Minister Chan. Uh, I wanted to ask about the vaccination for those under 16 year olds. Uh, what, what, when do you expect the approval to be granted? And because there seems to be a significant anxiety or apprehension among parents to have their young kids vaccinated, how would the government address this particular problem without making it compulsory? Uh, Junsen, we will have more information available when we have worked out the plans and the matrix together with uh, MOH. Yeah, um, I think maybe a bit of background. When the vaccines were developed, uh, they have to conduct quite very rigorous clinical trials. So it is not that the vaccine is unsafe for young children, but in the clinical trials, they did not test on enough children of that age group. And therefore, it is not approved internationally to be used on children. Um, but lately, Pfizer has been doing additional clinical trials on children between 12 to 15, and the data has been submitted, and I think now there has been approvals around the world and precedents around the world uh, that they can be administered to children of that age group, which is why we are also proceeding with children of this age group working with MOE. Yeah. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from CNA Digital? Hui Min, please. Thanks for taking my question. My question is more for Min Ong, I think. Um, bearing in mind the number of community cases which we haven't seen since the last circuit breaker, can I ask what's your response to calls to go back into full circuit breaker mode? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I thought this would be asked, but it's a very difficult question to ask at this time. Um, because, you know, this is a particularly difficult time to answer that question because you can see the cases rising and whether the trajectory goes exponentially up or flatten, which did happen uh, Chinese New Year this year. We saw cases going up and then it flattened and then it disappeared. And how, which direction it goes, uh, we will only know in the coming days. So, uh, so all I can say is as of now, we need to monitor the situation and then come to a decision later. And I don't give that answer because I want to stall the question. We genuinely need to have some questions answered. Number one, for example, today is the first day we impose more stringent measures, uh, social distancing measures, and today is the first day, in fact. And this time round, we decided to remove the most high-risk settings, meaning and closed space, crowded, no mask. It hits the restaurants the most. Huh? Uh, 
Uh, and so by removing the most risky settings, I think we make, will make an impact. And furthermore, there is also an indirect impact because once these places are closed, the general activity do go down. We find ourselves going out much less frequently. We will find ourselves going out much less frequently. And uh, home-based learning is coming on stream early uh, middle of next week. I think that will reduce activity even more. So what is the impact of that? We know there will be an impact. I think we will only know in the coming days. Second is, uh, I mentioned earlier, where you're pairing ART with PCR now and able to detect cases much faster. And so in the coming days, uh, we are also monitoring how will the cases surface. Are we able to flush out surface, uh, cases much more quickly? in the coming days, and we also want to find out that answer. Thirdly is something we are currently studying, which is what is the severity of the disease amongst those who are vaccinated or amongst those who got infected by someone who is vaccinated. And this is something that MOH is studying. We're still looking through the data. As of now, we can say that uh, for the 76 individuals who were vaccinated at least with one dose, uh, due to the current, uh, this, this round of outbreak, none require ICU, uh, but we need to dive deeper into the data and as more days go by. So really, seek answers to these questions and uh, when the time is right, we will make the right decisions. And if it has to come to more stringent measures, as Lawrence has said in the last MTF, we will do so. And if it's a CB, we will say it is a CB. Yeah. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from Mothership? Julia, please. Hi. Uh, Minister Chan, I have a question for you. Um, I understand that uh, HBL will only start from Wednesday. Um, considering that the virus is already in the community among students, uh, will parents and students who are worried about their safety be allowed to opt out of attending classes in the next two days? The short answer to that is that the schools, after today's announcement, in fact, the schools will be contacting the parents and the respective schools will work out the plans accordingly. Thank you, Ministers. Can we have the next question from SEMP? Sing Hui, please. Hi. Hi, good evening, ministers. Uh, I know you've been asked this a number of times, but you know, given the current situation and the number of unlinked cases that we have today, that brings our seven-day moving average to 4.71. And I know, Minong, you're no longer Minister of Transport, but where are we right now with the travel bubble with Hong Kong? Yeah, my answers have not changed from the last time Yeah, uh, I was here at the conference. I discussed with uh, Secretary Edward Yao uh, last Friday, yeah, and we recognize that Singapore, given uh, uh, our rising number of cases, it is not likely that we will meet the criteria for the launch. We were not likely to meet the, the criteria for the launch of the Singapore Hong Kong air travel bubble. But I think the the exact numbers we will know early part of next week. And Minister Isharan is fully aware of it. I think he's in touch with Secretary Albert Yao as well. And we will make a decision and an announcement, I believe, early in the coming week. Just to follow up on the question that was asked by Mothership earlier, I think bear in mind, no, so far we do have a few students being infected, but so far there's no evidence showing that there is school-based transmission. So I, I know... Uh, Principals, teachers, uh, parents, students are all cooperating, working really hard to make sure schools' protocols are really stringent, effective, and manage to keep schools safe throughout these 16 months. So uh, bear in mind, schools is a safe place. There has been transmission, but transmission outside of school. Um, and so for parents who want to opt out, uh, I, I, in the past, last year, the, the school's position is always do come to school. It is a safe place. Huh? Yeah. Thank you, Ministers. Can we get the next question from the H? Hui Chair, please. 
Hi, good evening, ministers. Uh, I just wanted to ask, because uh, Min Ong mentioned that now we are going to use uh, ART in conjunction with PCR test, and uh, we know ART do produce some false positives, does that mean that every day when we see the MOH uh, press release, will there be uh, cases adjusted down, let's say in the future, if, say for example, oh, it turns out to be a negative ART test or negative PCR test in the future? Uh, yes, it has slightly lower, it has lower specificity, um, especially for high CT scores. Um, but we are using both together, ART plus PCR. So the numbers you see in our daily reports is after the, the individual has gone through a PCR test and is positive, then we'll include in our daily reports. We will not, uh, just to be clear, we will not report numbers based on just ART score or ART results. Thank you, Minister. Can we get the next question from Wan Pao? You too, please. Hi, uh, good evening, Ministers. I'd just like to find out what's the progress of uh, issuing of the personal learning devices to students because uh, we are heading into another round of home-based learning. So uh, the original timeline was to have all secondary school students equipped by end of this year. Um, so in this respect, are we on track or do we have to accelerate the pace? And so how well equipped, uh, in essence, uh, our schools and our students for this upcoming round of HBL, given that you know, it's relatively announced at short notice. Thank you. Um, let me take that question. Our school system, actually, since last year's experience until uh, early part of this year, I think they have gone through the, the processes and they have oiled the machinery. So we are pretty confident that they have in place the processes and the devices for the children. But of course, we know that you know, once you give the devices to the children, once in a while, we have to check on the children to make sure that the together with the students, check with the parents that the devices are working properly and so forth. Now, but I want to emphasize this. Uh, we are not going into HBL suddenly because since our experience last year to now, regularly the schools have been, if you like, exercising their own system. So the HBL has been complementing some of the physical schooling even prior to this. So that is how we keep our system warm because we know that uh, just like now, there might be situations that warrant us to quickly switch into home-based learning. So whether is it the curriculum and the devices, they all have to be ready. So this is how our schools have been building up the system and the processes over the last one years and exercising that regularly. So, and, but I accept that there will always be last-minute changes or updates that we require and we'll work through this with the uh, respective students who may need a bit more help but we are fully committed to making sure that during home-based learning, our students have access to the necessary devices and we have in place the appropriate curriculum to conduct this uh, home-based learning for our students. But it is not, um, we, we do not switch it on and off uh, like that. In fact, actually, it has been kept warm at the background. In fact, this was one of the things that I checked with the team uh, even prior to me going into MOE when we review some of the contingency plans for uh, heightened measures for the management of the COVID. And one of the questions that I've asked them was, have they been keeping this system warm over the last many months? Uh, and the answer is that yes, many of the schools have kept the system warm over the last many months. And every time we activate that, we refresh the curriculum, we refresh the devices to make sure that they are all in working order. Yeah. Thank you, ministers. Can we get the next question from Channel 8? Zhu Xuan, please. Hello, good evening, Ministers. Uh, wondering if I can get Chinese sound back for two important questions. First, to Mr. Chan, would like to ask uh, why the home base, the full home base learning only starts in, uh, on Wednesday and not immediately. And also to Mr. Ong on the change in our vaccination strategy, starting from phase two, where we have a longer period between the two doses. Thank you. Now, to you, Tiger. 问题是为什么我们在星期三才开始这个居家学习计划
做出一些所需要的调整。所以我们是在最快的速度内，在星期三开始学习这个居家学习的计划。Thank you, ministers. Can we get the second last question from BT? Leila, please. Sorry, sorry, I think she wanted a sound bite from me as well. You're trying to catch me. Uh, let's see. Ah, we have three goals. Three goals. The first goal is to be able to prevent us from getting sick, getting the coronavirus infection. 第二就是，即使受感染，我们会不会，呃，会不会产生比较轻微的呃症状？第三就是，接受了感染过后，我们传给别人的可能性会不会大幅度的呃的减少？所以我们就因为这些原因啊，开始我们这个全国性的这个种苗呃接种呃计划。所以接种计划的现在这个第一个阶段啊，我看也七七八八了。这个第一个阶段，我们所主主要的目标呢，就是，呃，年长者，因为他们身体会比较弱，会比较，呃，受到这个病毒的伤害。第二就是前线人员，这包括医院的工作者，加上我们的海港，还有我们的机场，啊，和我们所有的前线工作者。所以现在大致上呢，嗯。所有的住在新加坡的人，百分之呃，百分之三呃四分之一已经受到呃接种到两支呃的这个疫苗了，呃三分之一接种了至少一支疫苗，所以我们现在现在正在想啊，呃这份工这这项工作其实已经进行了相当久，在严金勇部长的时候他就开始。研究说，我们下一阶段的这个呃接全国性接种计划呢，概念能不能改一改？就是说，既然我们的呃供应有限，能不能说下一个下一个阶段，尽量使越多人越多我们的住在新加坡的人接接受至少一支疫苗的接种，让大家越让。更多的人至少有一些的保护，因为呃，全国的很呃，全世界很多专家都研究过的，即使接种了一支疫苗，也会受到相当好的保护。所以这就是我们正在呃研究的呃详情呢。一旦有具体的详情，我们希望能够尽快的能够宣布。但是我们在进行这样的一个新概念呢、啊。呃，我我们的我们的概念就是说，第二支现在是第二支针呢，是在二十一天到二十八天之后，就是第一支针打了过后，第二支针是二十一到二十八天过后，看是 Pfizer 或者是 Moderna 能，所以呃，一些世界的专家就正在他们的意见呢，就是说你可以延长到。六个星期或八个星期，也不会减少这个呃接种疫苗这个疫苗的这个呃呃 effectiveness 可效率有效率啊、嗯！再讲一次啊，是你在考我，所以很多世界的专家他们也有他们也他们的见解就是，即使第二支疫苗第二支疫苗在六个星期到八个星期之后，它还是。保持了它的有效率，所以我们现在正在研究这项工作。但是如果呃要进行的话，大家我要确保让大家知道，那些呃国人呢已经有了，已经定了你第二支疫苗的预期啊，不会受到影响啊。这是接下来新的疫苗才会受到影响。我可以呃补充几点吗？刚才我们谈到说，为什么从星期三再开始？那除了技术性的问题，其实有一大一个很大的重点，那就是其实我们的家长都需要在居家学习呃学习的过程中做出一些生活上的调整，所以家长也需要一些时间来做出。他们呃相对的调整，就是比如说怎么样去照顾好孩子，因为不是每一个家长都能有在家可以监督他们的
孩子做居家学习的，因为有些家长是得到外面去工作，所以在这接下来的一两天里面，我们尽量的和家长一起的配合，做出一些新的调整，我们的计划，然后让我们的家长还有能安心的让他们的孩子居家学习。那另外一方面，我要呃补充的是，当然我们也意识到有许多的家长，因为他们有可能家庭有个别的需要，或者孩子有个别的需要，如果这些家长或者是孩子需要有更大的辅助的话，请联络我们呃教育部的学校，还有呃校长和老师们，我们也会尽量的配合来帮助他们呃做出这些相这些所需要的调整，所以在最大的。力度上，我们要帮助我们的家长还有学生，呃，一步一步的做出这个调整。那比如幼儿园或者是缺钱教育中心，或者是呃呃一些在社区的一些学生呃呃中心，他们也会继续的营业，因为我们意识到有许多的家长是需要有这些服务的。那另外一方面，我想强调的一点是。这是我们做出这决定，是因为我们在这几天里面可以看到这个在社区的疫情的急速的上升。那过了这段时期之后，我们更要考量啊，考虑到的是，在比较长远的时间内，我们要怎么样做出一个调整？因为从我们的角度，我们可以意识到，其实这个呃病菌可能在我们的社区里面。呃，会一段非常长久的时间。那如果在接下来的日子里面，如果在社区感染的风险是较为相对较为低的，在学校里面只有个别的一些呃案例的话，那其实我们不不需要把所有的学校都改成居家学习。那我们可以比较有针对性的让受影响的学校。和师生转入居家学习，那其他的学校还可以继续的呃上上课上学，因为我们知道，就算是在呃居家学习的过程中，它有一定的挑战性，也有一定的局限。那从师生的角度来衡量的话，我们还是希望能让我们的。年幼的学生，尤其是年幼的学生，能上学上课。那因为他们跟老师的过程的互动是比较好的，对他们的身心发展，对他们长远的学习是比较好的。所以，如果在社区病例平稳的时候，而只是在学校可能有个别的一两个案例的话，那我们就在长远里面可以有一个比较持续性的一个方案，就不用把所有的学校都。转入居家学习，那当然也有新另外一两个重要的考量，就是在接下来的日子里面，我们也将为更年轻呃一些学生，让他们接种，就是十二岁以上的，那也可以让他们有一定的一个保护，呃，那另外一方面，我们在测试那方面现在有可以做得更好更快，所以这也让我们可以缩小被影响到的。呃，周边的一些人士，因为在更快速的测试过程中，我们所需要呃受受到影响的其他学生或者是师生的话，的数目数量就相对的减低。那最后一点是要重申的话，其实，在学校和在学校以外，在学校里的环境还是相对比较安全的。所以，不过就算是。在学校里面的环境是相对安全的，我们也不能掉以轻心，因为我们在这次的经验就可以看到，往往是在学校以外的一些活动，如果我们松懈的话，就可能造成这些感染群。不过，我要向大家保证的就是，我们会以最大的力度，让我们的学校是一个安全学习的地方，让我们的。父母呃，家长们，他们能把他们的学孩子送到学校，能有那种安心。好 ，Thank you, ministers, members of media. Gentle reminder to only ask one question each. Can we get the second last question from BT Layla, please? Hello, 
thank you, Dr. Ministers. Uh, my question uh, is about the Shangri-La Dialogue and the World Economic Forum, which are scheduled for June and August this year. What's the latest update on that? Um, what has been the government's latest communication to the organisers so far? And um, regarding... Thank you, Leila. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, Minister Lawrence Wong answered that same question last week, which is the organisers will monitor the situation and closely and come to their own recommendations and decisions. Uh, the, the, there has not been further development since, and I, the answers have substantively not changed. Thank you, Ministers. Can we get the last question from CNE TV? Gwyneth, please. Hello. Yep. Hi. Um, my question, I hope you bear with me, is basically broadly just about uh, testing guidelines. Was there actually a possible lapse in detection because that tuition teacher uh, at Learning Point was not given a swab when she approached a doctor, even though she was given viral infection? And now that we actually have vaccination and we, we know that uh, there's more asymptomatic and muted symptoms, does that actually change our guidelines in terms of how we ring fast and identify these cases and do maybe more surveillance testing? And if so, are you going to be, uh, you know, are we going to be changing these guidelines soon and when? Um, I, I'm not, I don't know enough to comment on the specific case, but you are, the, the nub of your question is a valid, very valid one and relevant one, which is testing need to be fast. And sometimes we want very highly accurate testing for clinical diagnosis that is necessary. But now we also need to supplement them with a surveillance that may be less accurate, but allow us to detect and isolate infected cases much faster. Uh, and rapid ART is one possibility. Those who have seen some of my updates when I was in MOT, which is breathalyzer, is another form of very rapid surveillance, in fact, within a couple of minutes, but it's not as accurate as PCR. And of course, there's also wastewater testing is another possibility. So we need to employ all these methods. Uh, the more virulent the virus is, the more we need strong surveillance coupled with accurate PCR tests. So can I just make a final point that what I say in uh, Mandarin, perhaps I just reiterate in Chinese to emphasize this point. Now going forward, we must be prepared to live in a world where this COVID-19 virus could be endemic in society. We must find new ways to cope with this. We must find new ways to allow our students to continue learning in a safe environment. And Converting all schools to a home-based option may not be a sustainable solution. And we need different tools in our toolkits to manage the situation going forward. And that is why this time round, we are converting all to home-based learning because the community cases have gone up significantly. And we want, as an overall national posture, to really lower down the tempo of activities in our whole society. Now, going forward, if the community cases are stable or low, and if we have stochastic cases in the school, it does not mean that we must therefore then convert everyone into home-based learning because of a few, stochastic, a few stochastic cases when the community cases are either stable or low then we will have other ways that we can try to ring fence the affected schools by converting the affected school to home-based learning while allowing the rest of the schools to continue with uh, physical schooling. Because over the long term, we think there are limitations to uh, full home-based learning. The interactions between the students and the teachers, the physical interactions between the students and the teachers are an essential part of the transmission of values, role modelling and so forth for our students. So this is why going forward, we must make sure that we expand the, the suite of tools that we have in managing such cases. And we are very happy that with greater vaccination, with more rapid testing, 
will be able to try to limit the impact to as small as possible by using targeted measures on those schools or students that are affected. Uh, otherwise, it will not be a sustainable solution for us to convert everyone to full home-based uh, learning for a prolonged period of time. Thank you very much.